Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Johnny Kovacevic. I am the founder and second largest shareholder of Copper Bank Resources Corporation. And today, I'm going to talk about a theme that I think is very important for all investors that participate in natural resources, but specifically in the junior mining sphere. Using technology, can investors make a fortune in copper royalties? Of course, I'm talking about exploring the idea to use a blockchain to take a tiny portion of a project's reserves or resources and syndicate that or share that with individual investors rather than going on the conventional route of exploring the idea to partner or sell these royalties to larger companies. Uh, this forward-looking statement should be used in the context of everything I say throughout this presentation. And when I reference Copper Bank's assets, it's very important that you reference the disclosure on our website and in our presentation. Is the royalty business a good business? Well, we all know the answer is yes. A lot of smart people have made a lot of money for themselves and their shareholders because of the leverage or optionality that royalties offer investors. So the classic example is Franco Nevada, my friend Frank Holmes and my friend Pierre Lassonde. It has always outperformed general gold stocks. But the underserved market is in base metals, particularly in copper. So what we want to do it with, with Copper Bank is ask investors, if you could buy a fraction of a royalty, would you? I think the answer is yes. I think a lot of investors would explore that opportunity. And we as a company, if we were to fractionalize that with using technology, would people have appetite for these investors? We founded Copper Bank Royalty Corporation for the shareholders of Copper Bank. It cost me $30. We happen to own two advanced copper projects in the United States that did not have uh, a royalty, or the, we have the ability to put a royalty onto these two projects, $30. I will suggest to you in the strongest possible terms that these royalties are worth more than $30. The question is, is there a better way for us to monetize a royalty or royalties, like I described in the introduction? Copper Bank is exploring this idea. So as we build this base metal royalty company, I want to walk you through the rationale. Our market cap is $12 million. So we feel that creating this third business, so to be crystal clear, we have two advanced projects, one in Arizona, Copper Creek, one in Nevada, Contact, and now this royalty business. Now, we know it's worth more than zero, and the reason we want to explore this idea is because we feel, as owner-operators, that there's a tremendous amount of value that we can unlock for our shareholders. So the conventional path, if you have a zero discount rate, and you have to take this with a grain of salt, if a 2% royalty was applied to the economic study that was published for Copper Creek, that study was put out in 2013, and you can reference it on our website, based on that 18-year theoretical mine plan, would be worth $150 million. Now, I know no one's going to pay me that. What I'm trying to illustrate for you is it's worth more than zero. And if you look at the uh, contact project, a 2% royalty hypothetically on that project, based on the 9.4-year mine plan cont contemplated on the 2013 PFS study, which you can once again reference from our website, would be about $50 million. Well, they're not worth that. We know that they're worth more than zero. If I was to explore the idea of partnering or selling that the conventional way to a more mature royalty company, what are they going to offer me? Peanuts. What if there was a better way to do this? So the first question is, would someone buy or potentially buy a pound from me from this feasibility level project, pre-feasibility level project today at a discount? Here's how we conceptualize this. Let's just say this is before it becomes a, an operation and you take the, the various blocks of production that would come out of this project and I was to segregate 5% of the pounds. So that's, that's this area here. And I was to explore the idea to let someone, individual investors, to own various 
parts of the deposit. The first pound that would ever be produced out of this project obviously is worth more than the last pound. What would I be able to realize by exploring this path? So another way to look at it, this is just a visualization, but if you were to take them and just create 20 or 30 or 40 million pounds of feasibility level project copper pounds, what would someone pay me for these pounds? This is what we're gonna be exploring, and like a carpenter, you measure seven times, you cut once. I cannot tell you definitively how we're gonna move forward. All I'm trying to illustrate is that there is a, a lot of value that's non-dilutive that we can create or we can explore to advance with Copper Bank. My name is Johnny Kowachevich. I followed energy for over 20 years. I wrote a book called My Electrician Drives a Porsche. There's now 26,000 copies have been printed, and I'm an avid follower, proponent, analyst, investor, call it what you will, of the global energy matrix. I'm not a braggart, I earned it. The reason I'm invited to give keynotes at conferences all over the world is because I hope I'm able to um, articulate how the global energy pivot is impacting everything around us. So as far as Copper Bank is concerned, my largest shareholder is US Global and they did file this. It's a public document. They own some 13% uh, of the company. Uh, I'm the second largest shareholder. Uh, our recent financing, we're one of the few juniors that raises money above the market, no warrant, usually one investor. We were trading at four cents. I put $480,000 into the company at six cents without a warrant. We eat our own cooking. Why? We and me and my partners own tens of millions of shares. We're highly motivated to create, to get the leverage out of this business. I closed this financing. In the last eight weeks, I've bought another million shares. Now, I don't know how many junior mining company executives continue to support their companies. I'm not doing this because I'm a nice guy. I'm doing this because there's a tremendous amount of value in the assets that we already own. So Ben Graham used to say that the contrarian, this is what I am. I buy from pessimists with the aim to sell to optimists. We are in an epic bear market, and this is real estate. When you're buying development level copper projects, you're buying real estate, and you always make your money on the buy. So what kind of leverage do we have? We have to reference our resource reports that are on our website, but if you combine the, 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 those studies, we have a low market cap, that's based on how low we are on the scale, and we have a lot of pounds in inventory. So there's a rationale or reason that the leverage can work for this strategy. People have been telling me, visualize this. All we know is you as an investor, right now our share trades at four cents. Who cares, what does that mean? What do you own? What's the potential? So I'd like to show this based on the MPV, the net present value of our development projects, based on today's copper price, the, the, the net present value is $36 million, worthless. It took $120 million to delineate the, these work programs. But look at the leverage it offers as the copper price moves every 25 cents. At 325 copper, we've got $590 million of MPV. So if we don't issue another share, the torque. Now you never trade at a full MPV, but just look at the torque that's offered in this share. You go to three and a half dollar copper, now am I gonna get 10%, 20% of my MPV value? The point I'm trying to illustrate is that there's a tremendous amount of torque or optionality in the studies that we already have. When I did my financing three months ago, was 3% dilution. That is what you're gonna suffer. So every year you should see a 3% dilutive effect with this company. So let's talk about copper. I'm gonna get back to the royalty business in a minute, but this is very important that I give a report card in general because I'm gonna be giving some very important keynotes in the next two weeks. 75% of all the world's copper is fabricated into something to produce, transfer, or utilize electrical energy. I'm gonna be giving a keynote next week at Amman, Jordan to people that buy the vast majority of the world's copper. I did this two and a half years ago, and this is very important because they're the customer. And often they too, don't have the confidence to look beyond the headlines. If you go back to 2003, this is the green area. Copper moved in nine months, $2 a pound. We are now at a, I think, a, one of the worst bear markets we've ever seen 
And the question is, what will happen going forward? A famous German philosopher used to say, and I will quote him, the problem is not so much to see what nobody has yet seen, as to think what nobody has yet thought concerning that which everyone is looking at. That's what we're going to talk about in the next 15 minutes. The sentiment for copper is at zero. This is the comics indicator. Literally, they could not get one respondent to be positive. Now, I will suggest to you that we're closer to the bottom than we are the top. Nobody's involved in these things. When you look at the short positions, we're now at all-time highs. 2009 was not as bad 2008. This eventually has to be unwound. And we are playing by a new rule book. So when you, when you see how this is going to play out, in my view, uh, my friend Frank Holmes, two weeks ago in his Frank talk, talked about $5.3 trillion of family office money and where is it invested today? Nobody is invested in this space. Not gold, not copper, not base metals, not commodities. I believe some of these dollars are going to start funneling into this space because when you look at what Mr. Arthur Schopenhauer once said, the enabler of the future of energy is electrification, and that will be made possible with aluminum and copper. Copper is a unique commodity that's going to have a very significant CAGR growth rate. Royal Dutch Shell is now pivoting into the world of electrification, and we'll talk about this in a, in a second, but basically today, as we speak, only 19%, 19% of final energy usage is electrification. That's it. Energy's grown 2% a year, and the role that electrification plays has stayed with it. But that's going to change because we go in the next 30 years to about 50%, 5 0, of final energy is going to be something that's electrification. The greener and cleaner that you create and utilize green energy, the more that is demanded of copper. Fortunes will be made in the delta in this little triangle because what happens in the next 25 years or so is the amount of copper the world needs is going to double. Now, I don't care if you believe copper is going to grow by 1%, 2%. You can do that on your own time. But Rio Tinto tells us that, effectively, we need as much copper in the next 25 years as was consumed in the last 500. Think of the gravity, the magnitude of that statement. Now, once again, my, friend, my friends at Rio Tinto, they could be wrong by a power of magnitude. What I'm trying to show you is that it's going to take all this one commodity, this unique commodity is different than all others because it is the enabler of green energy. How do I visualize this, that only 19% of final energy is electrification? You have to do this visually. And imagine that almost everything you buy comes with an electrical cord stuck out the back of it. But they're not the things that use big energy. The magnificence of electrification. And now the other 81% of global energy is going to go hyperbolically towards something that does not use the internal combustion engine, but it uses electrification. GM settled their strike uh, two days ago, and it was job security. They know, they know, and they've told the unions now in Japan, in Germany, in the United States that it takes 50% less floor space to create an electric vehicle, and it takes 30% fewer hours. When you aggregate that over the billions of hours that we use to make vehicles, this is the reason the workers of GM were on strike. The game is over. This is now changing. At the chassis level, they changed the way they make cars. In Germany, the most important employer is, of course, the automobile. But a lot of these companies you don't recognize because they make things like cranks and pistons and radiators and valves, chains, mufflers, and you don't require these things in the electric vehicle. So 
they fought and they waited, but now it's happening. They, they are changing fundamentally at the chassis level how they make a car. These are the former CEOs, Harold Kruger of BMW and Dieter Zitsche of Mercedes. They've merged their car sharing platform because they also understand young people don't buy cars anymore. This has just started. So I always share people, they think that I, I'm a fan of Tesla and I am, I've tried that product. I have very comprehensive experience driving across America and Europe because it works. This is the factory that they're building outside of Shanghai, China. This is the starting date, January 7th, 2019. And this is what it looks like today. They're getting started. But the question that I ask is Copper Bank as an investor, how much copper cable has the Shanghai Tesla factory procured? None. Mercedes, BMW, Volkswagen. They haven't started that program where they buy week after week, month after month, year after year. That comes for the next 50 years, the rest of your lifetime for the young gentleman in the back row. People think that it was a false start. It's not, but they haven't procured those products. It takes 400% more copper to create one electric vehicle. This will start and this will be prevalent, increasingly so, for the rest of your life. I'm going to keynote the conference next week in Amman, Jordan. And that's important because these people buy the world's copper. They too are not positive. They're caught up in the negativity of the China-US trade tariff, potential recession coming. They don't realize that they're going to sell countless millions of kilometers more cable. So they need to get their ducks in a row. I spoke to them in Munich in July of 2017 and I gave a very eloquent, very colorful talk just like I did today and they agreed with me. Now I'm not saying I made the copper price jump but it did in fact go 20 cents the next day. And it stayed strong until Donald Trump put in the China trade tariff, the first one. It took the air out of the balloon. No reason to be positive. The, the bullions was gone from the market. And now I'm going to reprise a variation of that talk next week. And if you were in the business of making cable, first I'll just give everyone a chance to... Um, Email me if you want to get on my distribution list. I always update people after I give these major keynotes. What was the temperature or the barometer of those investors? Very important intel. But I frequent with these people. I go to these plants, these people that actually use the physical copper. This is me at Southwire. The number one buyer and fabricator of copper in the United States of America is Southwire in Georgia. 550,000 tons of copper every year. So their opinion matters. Oribis, their opinion matters. Pirelli, Mitsubishi, um, Ducab Cable. I want to know what's their thinking, what's their methodology. Because if I told them, if you were the CEO of a major copper, copper company, in the next 10 years, the copper prices are going to be lower or higher. I think most people agree with me there's going to be demand. Well, why are you not buying all the copper you can right now at this price? That's not how it works. People in this hall need to understand that nobody in the world wants high copper prices. It's not in their interest. Who sets the copper price? It's not the miner. The fabricator wants a low price. It's the speculator. They push the market. They control the market. And not entirely because there's an unholy alliance that exists between these two parties, the speculator and the fabricator, but the power of what's going on, it's the power of speculation. In the last 15 years, the financialization of commodities has taken over. So I show you two graphs. You could show the amount of the physical trade of oil on the left to the hypothecation, and you look at the, on, the, on the chart on the right in commodities. They do matter. And how those trends, and right now the trend is to be bearish bearish on everything. And if you're in the business of buying copper cable, you take that trade. They're willing to sell you that copper. Also the business cycle, you're selling a little bit less. You don't know, you, you have no confidence of what's gonna happen six months, nine months, 12 months down the road. I don't care about that. I have a long-term vision and the, how this movie ends in the next five and 10 years, that's what you need to look at because that's where fortunes are made with optionality. And that's what we're going to talk about for the balance of this presentation. All of their models, all of their forecasting, 
the old rule book doesn't work anymore. And as Mike Tyson used to say, everyone has a plan until pow. What would happen today if a major copper mine went offline because of an act of God? Copper and oil are two totally different commodities, and we need to start distinguishing the two. Copper follows oil, and I always tell people that. The red line is oil. The black line is copper. You notice how they all go up and down at the same time? It's decoupling. It is decoupling. And I'm going to show you why I think you're going to see it. People are going to start differentiating these two commodities because they have different, different trajectories for the future. We have went through a couple major hinges of history in global energy. When Thomas Edison perfected the incandescent light bulb, it was October of 1879. And his patron was John Pierpont Morgan. And it took a while to, for them to really make a commercial impact, but it was at a party at J.P. Morgan's house in 1882. He invited the who's who of New York society. And there he was. Thomas Edison, Thomas Edison himself flicked the light, and he says, welcome to the age of electricity. They all left. And the father of J.P. Morgan says, how could you embarrass yourself in front of all those important people? The richest man in the world at the time was John D. Rockefeller. He had no concern. He was not worried about electrification. Because you know how long it was going to take people to put these nonsense in every house across America? I mean, this is going to take 100 years. It took 10. All of a sudden, it became critical. And then what did they do? They found oil in tremendous quantities. And it happened with a Croatian immigrant, Anton Lucic, in Spindletop, Texas, on January 10th, 1901. They found oil under sulfur domes under pressure. And we had an abundant supplies of oil. What would you do? What would John D. Rockefeller do now? The internal combustion engine. And since then, till today, this has been the driver where I tell you 81% of final energy usage is a petroleum product used by the, by, the, um, by the internal combustion engine. Global energy has already entered another hinge of history. We will look at this date in the future and you'll see it. And it's two reasons, the supply and the demand. On the supply side, it happened at the OPEC meeting November 27 of 2014, and that's when Saudi Arabia decided to no longer be the swing producer. Fracking. They reinvented the wheel. It also happened with Dieselgate. In September of 2015, when there was the, the battle for chairmanship at Volkswagen, which took place four months before between Ferdinand Piech and Martin Winterkorn. In August of 2015, Volkswagen announced at the Frankfurt Auto Show that they were coming out with 20 electric vehicles. Three weeks later, Dieselgate. They had, they've changed the business model. And as I told you before, at the chassis level, they're changing the way they make cars. So this is going to have a tremendous impact with the incumbent energy companies. Royal Dutch Shell, which is a consolidation of two companies. It was Henry Dettinger's Dutch Petroleum and Marcus Samuel's uh, Shell Transport. And they merged three business models together. The extraction of oil drilling, refining, and transportation. But the vast majority of Royal Dutch Shell's market cap, over 300 billion US dollars, is because of the 44,000 marketing stations that they do own. And they know on a discounted cash flow model in the next 20 or 30 years, it goes to zero. It goes to zero. They are addressing this. This is the main driver. I don't think it's climate change. I be it for Western companies, there is the pressure for governments to persuade them to change their business model. But in other parts of the world, like India and China, it's pollution. They have no choice. And now you have the, this marching. Everyone's probably familiar with Greta, who collects millions of people in every city, and they march on climate change. She's not the issue. It's the electorate. All these young people become voters, and they're going to continuously, in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, as they become adults, they will be voting in people that are going to adhere to these policies. Whether you like it or not, that's what's happening. And as far as my, my friends at Shell, they understand that their product is what causes the vast majority of pollution and this uh, CO2 emissions. So they're changing. If you go back from 2010 to 2018, only 2% 2 of their R&D was based on these new technologies, peanuts. That's changing. 
Royal Dutch Shell has stated that by 2035, they will become the world's largest electricity producer because they do understand that this is the future. They will stop selling people gasoline and diesel. They will sell them electrons. Oil is only going to account for 25% of their revenues. In 2014, and this is just around the time that Donald Trump was thinking he's going to run for president. So the big bumper sticker issues, save coal, coal jobs, steel. Well, in the world, if you look at all the different countries, what was the cheapest way to make electricity? But it's changed just in the past five years. And that increasingly so, it's going to be the, the, the way forward. And it's going to be augmented by natural gas as peaker power. Why am I so excited about people in implementing these things? Why am I so excited about Greta marching in the streets of the world? That's because I'm an investor in copper. And I understand when you make one single turbine to create wind energy, they take almost five tons of copper. One, just one. Then there's the interconnectivity. And if you look at the average project, it takes 500% more copper to create one megawatt of this modern, greener, cleaner energy. This is a tremendous driver of future demand. And the single biggest investor in this field is going to be Saudi Arabia. They're investing $1 trillion in the future of energy. Now, I just look at it in a very selfish way. How much copper is that going to consume? But you're not going to get your joy or satisfaction tomorrow or next Tuesday. This is going to be one of these creeper things that helps the CAGR growth rate of copper for the next 20 years. He understands the supply that the United States is now the world's largest producer of oil. This is not going away. Look at it a different way. How much oil does America have to import? They don't import his product anymore. This has ramifications for Canada. Who are you going to sell your oil to? You have on one side, demand should eventually start tapering off, but you also have the extraction where people can extract more oil from more formations. So big oil tells us that the demand for oil is going to continue to grow. But when you start factoring in innovation, adoption, technology, consumer behavior, you get a delta of 40, 50 million barrels a day of where demand's going to be in 2030 or 2040. Now, I don't know. I can't forecast. I'm not that good. I'm just telling you that someone's going to get it wrong here. And I'm going on the side of technology, innovation, and everything else that's going on in the world because so far, the guys that have predicted growth, like IEA and the economists at Big Oil, have been wrong. How wrong could they have been? So what would you do with all these reserves? What would you do? You can't think like these guys. Now, I'm embellishing who's got the oil. But that's not what you should be looking at here. You need to think like the Japanese or the Chinese or the Indians or the Germans. They don't have reserves of petroleum. And now they have ways to accelerate this pivot away. So I'm going to go on the side of Japan and Germany, and I'm not going to go on the side of Iran, Iraq, Libya, Venezuela, you have to think about this. So where's energy security going to come from in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Production of oil and demand of oil every day today is 100 million barrels. And Saudi Arabia produces 10 million barrels, 10%. You ask any other investor that of primary copper, 40, 40% comes from Chile and Peru. You want to talk about energy security for the next 10, 20 years, you're going to be hearing those names a lot more, I can guarantee it. So it comes back to my demand equation, and I don't care which path you choose. I think demand for copper is going to be just okay. I don't lose any sleep at night based on that. But where are the reserves? Remember that map of the oil reserves? Copper is a totally different equation. We have right now, at this copper price, if we're not able to convert more pounds, we got about 20 years of reserves, thereabouts. So it's time to start characterizing the difference between these two commodities. I believe the demand of copper is going to be strong. I believe the demand for oil eventually starts tapering off. Oil comes from 4.7 million wells around the world. 45% of primary copper comes from 20 mines, the average discovery year, 1928. Because of the bear market we've been in for the past six, seven years, after Cobra Panama's commission this year, you end up with a vacuum. Copper mines take five years to build. There's a window 
That's going to support and fortify these discu this discussion that I've had with you today. So the shortage gets amplified. We've been in a shortage the last two years. Um, I believe there will be some kind of a shortage for copper next year and the year after and the year after. Eventually, this is going to have to reconcile itself. And that'll be reconciled with a higher copper price. So if I was using the Warren Buffett wisdom, you would say, okay, that's a commodity. We know how that movie ends. You end up with a shortage, the price goes much higher, you spend a lot of money doing expiration. Well, we tried that already. We tried, we spent $100 billion in the past 15, 16 years. But look how much discovery success we've had. That movie cannot be replayed. And I don't believe major mining companies are going to go spend 20, 30, 50 million dollars year after year. So it costs four cents a pound to delineate a pound of copper today. Four cents. How is it so that copper projects trade at one tenth of one penny? There's a disconnect there. And that's going to have to be met. The difference between drilling for oil and copper, look at the difference. Very little change. Very little exploration innovation. So people dispute the fact that there's the future of copper mining is low grade. So I show people. Here's the statistics of the largest copper deposits undeveloped. Most of them are owned by major mining companies. That's the turquoise. The beige companies are the ones that are still owned by juniors. If you visualize it, you could see that most future deposits are lower than 0.5% copper. If I go down the food chain, this is the data, but if I visualize it for you, once again, most copper projects are below 0.5% copper content. Think about the difference between oil and gas and copper. In oil and gas, you take a cubic kilometer of formation, they're able to get a lot more oil out of that because of innovation. In copper, there's no metal in the rock. No existe, as they say in Spanish. The grades have fallen lower and lower at higher elevations, no water, no infrastructure. 2010, because of the big boom in copper prices, we were able to produce copper. The, the top 15 copper producers ran 1.2% copper through their mills. And because of high prices, the grades kept fall lower and lower and lower. And now the future of copper mining is 0.3 and 0.4. This is important to summarize this discussion. If you have 1% copper ore, which doesn't exist anymore under the few satellite projects, at today's copper price, it's worth $66 a ton. But that's not the future of copper. The future of copper is 0.4. A ton of that ore, even at $4 a pound, is worth $35. That is why I believe the copper price has to go higher. I believe the copper price ends up somewhere in this orange square, not because of forecasting or deep modeling, it's because of the engineering to enable the next wave of copper projects. And that's a good thing. But other people think a little bit more optimistically than myself. Elliott Wave has copper going to seven and a half dollars. And it won't be pushed there by fundamentals. It'll be pushed there because of speculation. Because when those guys in the middle, when they really go long and they really get greedy, and they take all the slack out of the system, guess what happens to all the people that buy copper and make copper cable? They're buying from a speculator who's taken all the slack out of the system. But there's even a better scenario now, because if you really want the scenario, all these people marching, my friend Paul Gate at Bernstein has modeled the Greta scenario. Rick, you'll like this one. Check out this graph, Rick. The Greta scenario for copper, if she gets her dream, is actually $9 a pound, 20000 a ton, because we will eventually have to incentivize the lowest of low-grade copper projects, which is absurd, of course, you take this with a grain of salt. But if that's what they want, the new green deal, everything becomes electrified, where's the copper going to come from? So what we need for my strategy is $3.5 copper. I believe that's a plausible goal for every investor in this room to look at how does a project work at three and a half dollars. So if I show you the optionality, we look at from 275 to that price, our net present value goes from 12 cents a share to $4 a share. That's a pretty good risk reward, I would say. And that's another reason why we're looking at monetizing potentially one of our royalties. Now it would make no sense to sell a, a royalty for peanuts. 
What if I can look at better ways to monetize that, which is what we're exploring, this whole idea of, of seeing throughout a theoretical deposit, what would someone pay me for a future pound of production out of a project that has an economic study? Our market cap's $12 million. You look at us as three businesses, 100% owned development project in Arizona, Nevada, and a royalty company, which right now has zero value in Copper Bank. This is our share price. You can see the two and a half years ago when the copper price made a move, copper price went up 40%, we went up 300%. On that note, I thank you and I wish everyone happy investing. Mm -hmm.